Well, hello everyone. This is Al Fadi, and I'd like to welcome you back to Let Us Reason. And today uh, we have uh, the Sam I Am, and we're going to be continuing with our series on refuting Shabir. Now, if you were here last time, you noticed that Sam uh, zoomed in on a very powerful topic. In fact, we got a lot of views uh, about that topic, which is, uh, you know, Shabir was doing a, a, a supposedly refuting a video series that I did on the original sin from Islamic sources. And he ventured into Genesis chapter three and began to talk about what was going on in there after the fall. And in Genesis 3, 8, he talks about the fact that God somehow was wandering in the, uh, you know, during the day and he made fun of that. So um, Sam, by the grace of God, cap capitalized on that. And we showed that really the, the phrase actually has nothing to do just with the uh, saying God was walking, but the word of the Lord was walking. And we spent the whole show talking about this, which is what, which was, in my view, was very powerful. So uh, today, hopefully, we will continue along, uh, you know, the same theme. And uh, we'll leave it over uh, <laughs> this time, of course, to uh, decide on what other aspects of Shabir's talk that we would like to address today. But keep, I mean, make no mistake about it, folks. We're going to refute Shabir one way or another, but we're going wow. to just dissect it one piece at the time. With that said, Sam, okay. thank you for being here with us, brother. I wanted you just to swallow your sandwich. Uh, and yeah, I had the, the piece of bread. I, I need some energy to talk physically. But hey, someone just congratulated you. You got 40,000 subscribers, man. I guess that's what I had today or yesterday, something like that. Man, yeah. man, bro, I'm starting to hate on you. I'm being envious and you know I'm jealous. But Glory to God. It's all for the glory of Jesus, brother. Amen. Amen, Amen one, brother. Thank one thing you so about much. you, I just want to share this, and we're going to Thank pray you. and begin. <clears throat> you yes, are sir. proof that you don't have to be good looking to have a successful ministry, and I appreciate you. Thank you. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, let's just ask the Lord to be glorified. All right. <clears throat> we love you, Father. The Lord Jesus, Son of God, we love you. Holy Spirit, we love you. We depend on you. So, Holy Spirit, I ask for the glory of the beloved the Lord Jesus, anoint al Fadi and myself, guide us to speak truth without error, perfect our ability to recall the scriptures and to interpret them correctly and enable us also to deal with this false satanic system, Islam, and accurately represent its false teachings and by your power, demolish it for the glory of Jesus Christ. And bless everyone who's listening to understand with illumination from your presence, loosen our tongues, Holy Spirit, for the glory of Jesus. We need you, we love you. Lord Jesus, we need you. We love you. And Father, we need you. We love you. In the name of Jesus, be glorified and bless this session in Jesus' almighty name. Yeah, the Father, Son, and Spirit. Amen. Okay. Amen. So, brother, uh, where do you want to go today? Uh, well, like I said, I and this and today I'm going to be focusing on his criticism of Genesis, Genesis 3, and his criticism of, of Paul. Lord willing, in subsequent sessions, if the Lord Jesus is pleased, I'm going to also address his distortion of the Quran <clears throat> and the excuses he tried to come up with to explain away the problems inherent in the Quran and the tradition, because that's what Shabir does. Shabir is infamous for rewriting Islam. In other words, when you talk about Shabir and Islam, it's not Islam. It's what I call his Islam, meaning Shabir's version of Islam that does not exist historically does not exist in the Quran and the Hadith. He simply makes it up as he goes along, reinterprets the Quran and Hadith, or explains them the way, or simply rejects the Hadith, because I'm going to have to say this. I'm being as honest as I can to the Lord Jesus. I'm not interested in being politically correct. The problem is too many Christians have given Shabir the respect he does not deserve because they think they're honoring the Lord Jesus Christ when they honor the charlatan. He's a charlatan. He's a snake. He's not a man of integrity. And that's simply the truth. And here, Christians, I'm going to challenge you. Do not let myself or Al Fadi or William Lane Craig or Mike Lacona model what Christianity is supposed to be like and how we're supposed to treat unbelievers. <clears throat> what I want you to do, and please take me up on this challenge. Here's my challenge to everyone. I want you to read the scriptures, and I want you to show me any single place where the prophets, the Lord Jesus, and the apostles treated those who oppose the truth, 
treated those who attacked the true God, treated those who perverted the scriptures with respect and honor and dignity. Can you show me one? This is my open challenge to every one of you. Mike Lacona, William Lane Craig, Daniel Wallace, James White, Rob Bowman, myself, Al Fadi, David Wood, we are not examples for you to follow. The examples for you to follow are those inspired men and women of God, filled with the Holy Spirit, empowered by the Spirit to preach the gospel, to defend the gospel, and even die for the gospel. So my challenge to every one of you, show me, please, prove me wrong, single place where the apostles of our Lord, the Lord himself, and the prophets before the Lord became flesh, showed any respect and honor to any false prophet, false teacher, Bible pervert. And I will publicly apologize for my approach, okay? That's my challenge. Amen. Now let's see, Al Fadi, how many people are going to be able to prove me wrong. Because we live in a time, my brother, where this westernized version of Christianity is being propped as the standard by which apologists and theologians are to live up to. And if you don't live up to that standard and that decorum, then you're shunned and brushed aside as being <clears throat> hateful, unchristlike, and you know, disrespectful to the Lord. But prove me wrong. With that said, let's get into the meat of the matter. Now, I took some notes. It is vitally important for every one of you to go back on Shabir Ali's Facebook page because he didn't do this on YouTube. He did it for Facebook Live. Find his session on Al Fadi. Even titled yeah, it. just type original sin Al Fadi, you'll find it. Yeah. You, you will, huh? Okay. I didn't know that. I had to look for it. But anyway, here are some notes that I took. We're going to address one point at a time. And I'm trusting the spirit to guide us to save me from error, to accurately <clears throat> interpret the scriptures as I respond to him. So we already dealt with <clears throat> cool of the day. <clears throat> he also said this, and I have the notes here. Claims that the rest of the Old Testament does not look back to or mention the Adam and Eve story, right, with the, with the exception of Paul. So his argument is, this is what he says, if you look at the Old Testament, you will find not a single reference to the Adam and Eve story. And if you go to the New Testament, basically the same thing exists with the exception of Paul. So his point is, it is Paul who champions the story of Adam and Eve, their fall, and its effect on human nature. So basically, this is an indirect shot on the Apostle Paul. In other words, what is Shabir trying to say? The Old Testament, Jesus and the Apostles said basically nothing about Adam and Eve, their fall, and how it affected mankind. That's the Apostle Paul. And in saying that, see again, Shabir is like his father, the serpent, very subtle, and it's ironic, we're talking about Genesis 3, where the serpent will be mentioned. <clears throat> so he is, in a subtle way, attacking Paul, <clears throat> discrediting Paul for focusing on Adam's sin and its effect on the human race. <clears throat> when Jesus was silent on it, said nothing about it, the other apostles said nothing about Adam's sin affecting mankind, nor the Old Testament books. So you see what he's trying to do, right? He's indirectly pitting Paul against the Old Testament prophets, the Lord Jesus, and the apostles. Now, <clears throat> two responses. Number one, you cannot make heads or tails out of the Old Testament narrative or the New Testament <clears throat> without presupposing the Adam and Eve account. In other words, everything that follows, everything that flows... In the Old Testament, New Testament, flows from, follows from the story in the garden. And if I had time, I'd unpack it. This is why all serious students of the Holy Bible, all seri serious students of the Word, need to go back and study the Genesis account very carefully, specifically the first three chapters, study them. Understand what is being said, because once you understand the narrative, once you understand Genesis 1, Genesis 2, Genesis 3, then everything that follows will make greater sense because everything that follows after this event is built on the foundation of what takes place in the garden. 
it presupposes the story of Adam and Eve. And this is not an exaggeration. I'll give you an example of what I mean. Even the sexual ethics, the laws concerning appropriate sexual behavior and inappropriate sexual relations, which is found in Leviticus 18, Leviticus 20, Deuteronomy 22, all of that presupposes Genesis. What do I mean? Do me a favor, brother, real quickly, because, again, it would take sessions, multiple sessions, to show how the entire Old Testament, New Testament, not just Paul, presupposes the account of Adam and Eve in the garden, their moral failure, and the effect it had on the entire human race. But now, just to show you what do I mean, that everything that follows from Genesis chapter 1, 2 to 3 is built on the foundation of, of Genesis chapter 1, 2, and 3, and presupposes the story in the garden. Go to Genesis chapter 2, brother, if you don't, if you can. All right. You get there. When you go to Genesis 2, verses 19 to 20, read that for me. All right. Now, before, in fact, start at verse 18. I'm sorry. Let's read Genesis 2, 18 to 20. Very good. Starting from verse 18, Genesis 2. Then the Lord God, uh, the Lord God said, It isn't good for the man to be alone. I will make him a helper suitable for him. Out of the uh, out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the sky and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called a living creature, that was its name. Verse 20. The man gave names to all the cattle and to the birds of the sky and to every beast of the field but for Adam, there wasn't found a helper suitable for him. Guys, see, here's me. You want me to scripture, trusting the Holy Spirit to illuminate us and grant me clarity, clarity of speech? Did you catch what Genesis 2.18 said? It is not good for the male to be alone. So God is going to create a suitable helper, a help me suitable, compatible with him. But many people don't read carefully, and so they miss Genesis 2.20, when the animals are brought forth by the Lord God so that God would see what Adam would name them. And by the way, let me explain why God is allowing Adam to name the animals. Let's go to Genesis 2.19 one more time. You guys want meat, right? This is why it's going to be maybe 20 sessions in the series. Amen. Okay. Amen. We want to dissect him one by uh, one. by one. Okay, so uh, Genesis 2. Yes, Genesis 2.19 again. It says, the Lord God, Yahovah Elohim, brought the animals to man, Adam, the male, to see what the male, the man, would name them. Read that for us. All right. So out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the sky and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. Now, and why did God name the animals? I know you're excited, my brother, but I just want them to see. Oh, no problem. I want them to see. Why did God not name the animals? Because people don't know this. Now, people don't understand. In the Bible, when you give something or someone its name, that shows you have authority over that thing or someone. And I'll illustrate that with children. You name your children because they're your children. And that name sticks with them. And if your children are honorable and they honor you, they're going to keep the name that you gave to them. A sign of dishonor is when they change their name because they're rejecting your authority over them, your right to name them. So in the Bible, naming something or someone indicates you have authority over that thing or someone. So when God is saying through Moses that God brought the animals to Adam so that Adam would name them, that was Adam exercising his dominion over the animal kingdom because whatever name he gave that animal, that animal was stuck with it. Because right. after all, animals don't name themselves. Humans do. A dog doesn't call itself a dog. Humans call it a dog, right? An elephant doesn't go around saying, hey, I'm an elephant. Humans give animals their names, and those are the names that they're stuck with because we have over authority over animals to name them. They can't name themselves. They can't name us. We have the ability to name them as a sign that God has created us higher than them, and they're in subjection to us. And that's found, straight, stated where? Genesis 1, 26 to 29. Here, let's go to Genesis 1, 26. Very good. 
because God wanted us to have a dominion. Yes, right there, Genesis 1, 26. All right, Genesis 1, starting from verse 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on earth. God created man in his own image. That's 27, right? That's 27. God yeah, created 26, man. 326. You can stop there. I don't want you to go all the way to 29. Read 26 one more time. All right. Uh, then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Did you guys catch it? He read it twice. I'm not trying to interrupt him, but I want you to catch the point. Mankind, male and female, the one Adam, rule over the animals, the fish, and the fall of the air. And what was the sign that they rule over them? That man named them. They didn't name themselves. They didn't name mankind. Man named them. Now, to show you God's authority over man, who named man? God did. Who called man, man? God did. You catch it here? But now here's something that's not going to sit well with many feminists. And I'm sorry, I'm not here to be unnecessarily offensive, but I'm not here to tickle your ears. I'm here to be biblical. I want to be biblically correct, not politically correct. Who named the woman? First, God named the female, Adam. But then who gave her the name woman? The male did. Who called her Eve? The male did. Adam called his wife woman, Isha, because she came out of Ish. And then in Genesis 3.20, it says Adam called her Eve. Women, that tells you that from the very beginning, God designed it that man would have authority over his wife, positional headship over his wife. That's biblical teaching. Notice Eve doesn't name Adam. Adam names Eve. He's the one who says, Flesh of my flesh, bone of my bones. You are called women because you came out of man. And in Genesis 3.20, it says, Adam called her Eve. That again shows you from Scripture before the fall and after the fall. Before Adam and Eve sinned in a perfect world, perfect environment, Adam named her. And after the fall, he names her again. Folks, this is biblical teaching. And the feminization of men... And the masculinization of women has led to great destruction and chaos in society, led to dysfunctional homes, raising dysfunctional kids because women want to oppose the natural order of things, the order instituted by God. And when you go against God, you create hell on earth and bring misery and destruction. Right. Okay. Now, that was the first point I wanted you to see from Genesis 2.19. Now, let's go to Genesis 2.20 to see the second point. All right, Genesis 2.20. So in Genesis 2, verse 20, we read, Then man gave names to all the cattle and to the birds of the sky and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper suitable for him. Now, guys, connect the narrative and how this is going to be found the foundation for sexual ethics. All our sexual ethics flow from Genesis. Notice, was there any animal compatible with Adam? None, right? Did you see what it says? And there was no compatible partner found for man, Adam among the animals. That's why later on in Leviticus 18 and 20, bestiality is condemned. Do you, now you see where I'm going with this. Bestiality is condemned because animals are not compatible with humans. The two cannot cohabit. Where do you get that from? You got it from Genesis 2.20. Among the animals, there was none suitable to be a helper for Adam. And marriage emerged out of these well, backgrounds and pretext. I, mean, I love yeah. you, man. Okay. Yeah. You, you, can, you, can text, you can text me your opinion if you like. Sure. But you get it there? So who was compatible for Adam to be his helper? A woman. Because now if you read Genesis 2, we're going to skip it because in 21, 22, God puts him in a deep sleep, cuts his side open, and fashions a woman. Let's read Genesis 2, 23, 24. 
All right. Genesis uh, 2, 23, 24. All right. 2, 23 and 24. Okay. Uh, verse 23. The man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife and they shall become one flesh. Okay. Did you catch it? When God said in Genesis 2.18, it is not good for the male to be alone. I will make him a helper suitable for him. When God did make that suitable helper, he didn't make that helper male. He made that helper female. So from the get-go, from Genesis chapter 2, you are told by the creator of heaven and earth, the only compatible sexual union pleasing to God, acceptable to God is between male and female, one male in gender, one female in gender, one born male in gender, one born female in gender, not someone who changes his gender. And this is why I'm saying that the entire Bible, Old Testament, New Testament, presupposes the Genesis account of creation and builds on the foundation of Genesis, which is why when you mythologize Genesis, dehistoricize Genesis, you destroy the foundation for sexual ethics. And the two go hand in hand. You see Amen. the pattern? Pay attention to all those so-called Christians who are fake Christians that try to justify same-sex same -sex unions or transgenderism. Those are the same individuals who mythologize Genesis and dehistorize de Genesis saying it's not historical, the historicize, sorry, I'm getting a little animated. And that's why they no longer have any foundation for sexual ethics. It all goes out the window. It becomes a cultural thing. It becomes subjective because they've destroyed the foundation of their morality, the Holy Bible. Everyone see that now? So just because the Old Testament mm -hmm. writers don't explicitly reference Adam and Eve, or just because our Lord and the apostles don't explicitly mention Adam and Eve, that doesn't mean they are not building on the foundation of that story or presuppose that story as the basis for their teachings when it comes to morality and other things. Amen, brother. And the Lord himself says, unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sin. So uh, right there, he's tying it back to the garden. And just to show my point, since you mentioned that, our Lord himself goes back to Genesis to establish God's norm for marriage. Our Lord himself, Amen. Genesis 1, verse 27, Genesis 5, verse 2, and Genesis 2, 24, to establish what is God's norm for healthy marriage. Go to Matthew 19, verses 4 to 6. Amen. It's one of the beautiful passages. Matthew 19. Let me get that out of the way. All right, Matthew 19, starting from verse 4. Yes, this is talking about marriage and divorce. All right. And he answered and said, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female and said, For this reason a man shall, uh, shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Did you guys so catch it before you finish it? He just quoted Genesis 1.27, which is found in Genesis 5 verse 2 and Genesis 2 verse 24. And now finish it, my brother. Good. I just wanted to hear what he's quoting. All right. And um, verse 6. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. They so said Jesus, to him. Jesus right. just presupposed Genesis account of creation. And what is suitable, compatible relationships male and female to coming together become one flesh not male and male not male and two females or three females or four females not one female with two males or three males one male one female and the two not the three not the four not the five become one flesh the two become one flesh you catch it there man so the ideal the norm for marriage is one male, one female, not one male, one male, not one female, one female, not one male and multiple females. So what God allowed in the Old Testament, these were concessions that he made 
to meet his people where they're at. Now God is calling us to a higher standard and elevating us to live up to that standard. Amen. And incidentally, Sam, which you know, the Hebrew word is ahad. Uh, or, uh, one yeah. flourish. Now, with that said, let's go to the second problem with Shabir's assertion. Shabir's assertion is, since Paul is the one who focused so much on Adam's relationship to Christ and Adam's effect on the human race, that this somehow calls into question the validity of the doctrine, because that's what Shabir is trying to get you to see. That Paul is the one who came up with it. We shouldn't really believe Paul. Okay, now, we have several problems. Number one, Paul is writing in the lifetime of the eyewitnesses of Christ. He's met the eyewitnesses. He's met Peter. He's met James. He's met John. And he's received the right hand of fellowship from them. How do I know? Just read Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 2. So number one, Paul has the benefit of having the very eyewitnesses of Jesus amening his ministry, <clears throat> approving of his ministry, giving him the right hand of fellowship, and <clears throat> testifying that the gospel he preaches is the gospel they pray, preach, number one. Now, if Shabir is consistent and he's not a snake, he must now condemn Muhammad to hell because Muhammad comes 600 years later, never met any of the eyewitnesses of Jesus, never had any of the eyewitnesses of Jesus confirm his ministry and give him the right hand of fellowship. So if you're going to question Paul, who's writing within the lifetime of the very eye and ear witnesses of Christ, who confirmed Paul, gave Paul the right hand of fellowship, testified that he's an apostle approved by the Lord, and the gospel he preaches is the gospel we preach, and you're still going to question him? How much more question Muhammad, the son of the devil, who contradicted all that Jesus taught, the apostles taught, and the Old Testament teachings, thereby exposing himself as an antichrist? You see the point? Amen. You with me there? Now, that's 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 the first part. Moreover, if Paul did hijack Christianity, Shabir again proves Muhammad is a false prophet and Allah, his God, is a false God. Here's why. Christians, remember this argument. I'm going to give you two verses from the Quran. I'm going to read them and break them down. This is why Shabir will never debate me. And I'm calling you out, Shabir. I know people are going to send you this link. Be a man and prove to the world that you have confidence in Allah and his messenger. Debate me, because I promise you, by the power of Jesus Christ, Muhammad's God and judge, I will end your ministry as a Muslim da'i for the glory of Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit. Take me up on it, Shabir. Prove me wrong. But now, I'm going to read two verses. Chapter 3, verse 55. If Paul hijacked Christianity, if Paul corrupted the message of Christianity, if Paul perverted the message of Jesus, then Paul is greater than Allah, and Allah is an impotent weakling in the face of Paul, or Allah lied, or Allah is a false god. Why? Because let me read this. Chapter 3 of the Quran, verse 55. Chapter 3, verse 55. Behold. Oh, my goodness. How can somebody be stupid? Muslims are calling. How stupid can this Muhammadan be to call me while I'm live? I can hear me in the background, by the way, brother. Your mic is on. You can hear me. Okay. okay. Chapter 3, verse 55. Behold, Allah said, O Jesus, I will take thee and raise thee to myself and clear thee of the falsehoods of those who blaspheme. Now notice what the Quran has Allah telling Jesus. Guys, remember this. Chapter 3, verse 55. Suppose Allah talks to Jesus right when he's about to take Jesus into heaven. I will make those who follow you, Jesus, superior to those who reject faith, to the day of resurrection. Let me repeat that, because Christians, if you don't remember this argument, you're not going to know how to use this to pretty much end Islam, destroy Muhammad's reputation. Okay, here. I will make those who follow you superior to those who reject faith to the day of resurrection. So here's what the Quran just said. The Quran said, from the time Allah took Jesus to be with him, Jesus' followers were guaranteed to be superior, dominant, uppermost against the disbelievers, and Jesus' followers would be superior till the day of resurrection. Now, I want to make sure everyone's getting this. From the time of Jesus' physical ascension, Jesus' followers were victorious, superior. They overcame the unbelievers, 
And that victory was guaranteed to be theirs till the day of resurrection. Now, the Quran records Allah kept his promise. Here it is. Let me show it to you. Chapter 6, 61 verse 14. Chapter 61 verse 14. Please pay attention and get the argument. 61 verse 14. Oh, you who believe, be helpers of Allah, as said Jesus, the son of Mary, to the disciples. Who will be my helpers to the work of Allah? Said the disciples, we are Allah's helpers. Then a portion of the children of Israel believe and a portion disbelieve. But we, this is Allah speaking, we gave power to those who believed against their enemies and they became the ones that prevailed. So chapter 61 verse 14 said, Allah himself empowered the believers. Exactly. Jesus empowered them. They prevailed. They conquered the unbelievers and they would be empowered till the day of resurrection. Now, let me unpack the implication. If the Quran is right, Jesus' true followers won. And if the Quran is right, the true followers of Jesus will remain uppermost till the day of resurrection. That means when the disciples overcame, then their followers who follow their footsteps would overcome, and their followers and their followers, all the true believers, would overcome and be dominant till the day of resurrection. Now, folks, here's the problem for Shabir. Half of the New Testament was written by Paul using either scribes or him personally writing it. 13, if not 14 of your New Testament books come from Paul. Paul's message spread like wildfire all over the then known world. And Paul's message became the dominant message, the dominant gospel from the first century till this very day since over 90% of Christians follow the New Testament. I'm saying over 90%. 100%, but again, let's say 90, just to be safe, because not every Christian really believes, follows the New Testament, where you have 13, if not 14 books, coming from Paul, influenced by Paul and his theology, which means Paul's message became dominant, became superior, became uppermost, and it's still dominant and uppermost, and it's still <clears throat> spreading all over the world. Now, if Islam is true, then Paul must be a true apostle and his message must be true. Because what did the Quran say? The true followers of Jesus were victorious. They overcame the unbelievers. They became superior and their victory and dominance will remain till the day of resurrection. Well, Paul became victorious. He became superior. He overcame other false gospels. And his gospel is still dominant and spreading all over the world. Therefore, Paul must be a true apostle if the Quran is right. Now, just to let you know, this is not my logic. El Qurtubi. El Qurtubi. And before you became a Christian, when you studied the Quran, there were certain commentators you had to look to to understand the Quran. From your background, can you tell us how important is El Qurtubi? Oh, he's, he's probably considered uh, the father of what we call tafsir, uh, Quranic tafsir or, or commentaries. And simply because he's among the first uh, to become uh, a prominent source for Quranic uh, exegesis. Al-Qurtubi, you heard it, right? Yeah. Now, let me tell you how Al-Qurtubi interpreted chapter 61, verse 14. How Al-Qurtubi interpreted Chapter 61, verse 14, where it says, the, those who believed in Jesus became victorious over the disbelievers. Here's his interpretation. And he gets this interpretation from Ibn Ishaq. Let me read it for you. Here you go. It was said about this verse. He's quoting 61, 14. Qurtubi. It was said that this verse, this verse was revealed about the apostles of Jesus. May peace and blessing be upon him. Ibn Ishaq stated, now guys pay attention, who are the apostles that believed in Jesus, that one, and were made victorious. Ibn Ishaq stated that of the apostles and the disciples, meaning the followers of the apostles, that Jesus sent with Jesus' authority, authorized by Jesus. There were Peter and Paul who went to Rome, in case you missed it. Among the apostles and disciples that Jesus sent out, one of those that Jesus sent out, was Paul, 
who accompanied Peter to Rome. Peter and Paul who went to Rome. And then mentions others, Andrew and Matthew, who went to the land of the cannibals. Thomas, who went to Babel and the Easter lands. Philip, who went to Africa. John, who went to Damascus, which is a tribe to whom the sleepers of the cave belong. Jacob went to Jerusalem. Bartholomew went to the land of Arabia. Oh, so Jesus even sent Bartholomew to the Arabs. So the Arabs had the gospel of Jesus preached them by an apostle that Jesus sent out with the power of Allah. Hmm. Specifically, Al Hijaz, Simon was sent to barbarians, Judas and Barthas, who went to Alexandria and its surrounding regions. Folks, did it sink in? Did you guys got it? So the Muslims not... took the Quranic passage at face value and believe what the Quran said that Jesus' true followers won, they were superior, they vanquished unbelievers, and they spread Jesus' message successfully by the power of Allah backing them up. And their victory will remain till the day of resurrection. But then these Muslims look at the history of the church and they go, oh, wow. One of those whom God empowered was Peter. The other was Paul. And Peter and Paul accompanied each other. And God empowered both of them to go to Rome and preach. Yeah. And um, I want to just uh, respond to uh, someone here by the name Abdul Masih. Uh, he probably assumed that we're saying Al-Qurtubi is the only uh, uh, prominent source of exegesis. Al-Qurtubi is among, among those fathers of exegesis. Ibn Abbas, by the way, is considered to be the originator of that, but we don't have a whole lot of manuscripts of his work. But I wanted to say this. The reason why Al-Qurtubi is even more important than Al-Tabari when it comes to this, Sam, because in the course of 300 years after Al-Tabari, you begin to see exegetes like Al-Qurtubi, for instance, Ibn, Ibn uh, Kathir and the likes. They bring uh, the authority of Muhammad into their discussions as well. So that's why they become more and more reliable than, for instance, Al-Tabari at some point. So everyone got it, right? You're getting all these facts. If you're understanding our points, let me again repeat like a broken record. The arguments we're giving you are spiritually battle-tested arguments, arguments we use in spiritual battle that have been perfected by the Spirit, they're irrefutable, folks. They are irrefutable. If you understand the arguments, use the arguments, use the material. And I got articles on this on AnsweringIslam.net and on my blog. So if Shabir is right to question Paul, Shabir just destroyed the Quran, destroyed Muhammad and his God. You with me there? Did you catch it? You see what he did? In other words, if Paul is the one who came up with this concept of Adam and its effect on humanity in order to contrast Adam with Jesus, the last Adam, and that message has become dominant and it's spread to the point that all Christians have been impacted by Paul's view of Adam, the fall of Adam, and its effect on humanity, anthropology, and yet Paul is a false apostle, that means either Allah lied, when he said the true followers of Jesus won, or Allah wanted to help Jesus' true followers, but Paul proved to be so much greater and better than Allah that Allah was not able to stop Paul. Paul was able to defeat Allah, overcome Allah, making Paul greater, not Allah. So Muslims need to start saying, Bulis al Akbar. Bulis al Akbar. Paul the greater, because he's greater than Allah and his messenger. But. Exactly. If, exactly. I mean, let me finish this point real quick, and then I want you to say something. But if Allah did keep his promise, then Paul is an instrument of Allah. Allah backed up Paul. Allah empowered Paul. Allah is a true servant, and his message is the truth, which means Muhammad is a fake and antichrist, a son of Satan, for contradicting Paul. And Allah never spoke to Muhammad. That's true. And you know, Sam, what, what is so amazing to me is that why did Allah and his prophet miss the point about Paul? It would have been perfect for them to say anything about Paul. Why did they miss it? They mentioned Abu Lahab by name. Why did they miss? They mentioned other uh, prophets by name. Why did they miss to talk about Paul as a false prophet? What, what was the big deal about that? They could have condemned him, whereas all, well, let me be careful. A great majority of Muslim scholars, both early and later, confirmed Paul was a true apostle sent by God to preach the message of Jesus Christ. And we have this article on the blog. I'm going to post it in 
the comment section. Here you go. Thanks to a brother in Jesus Christ, someone <clears throat> took the trouble of going to these Arabic sources and translate them in English. Here's the article, folks. I'm putting in the comment section. I'm going to put the link twice, and then I'll send it to uh, Brother Al to put it in the description box. Yes, now, I'll do that. Now, here's the article. I just posted it. Let me give it a third time. A great number of Muslim scholars, both early Muslim scholars and later, confirm that Paul was a true apostle of God, of Jesus, sent by Jesus in the power of God to preach the message of Jesus. And I gave you the article. Shabir, your career as a da'i is over because your lies are coming to an end by the grace of Jesus Christ. So that was that one point. So I'm going to X out all the points we've covered yeah. thus far. And I want to say just one thing. I just, folks, I just blocked someone for using vulgar language against Sam. And I really don't care if he used it against Sam, me, or anyone here. You use any vulgar language, that's the end of your presence here, period. Go ahead, brother. Well, that, what that means is they're seeing by the grace of Jesus Christ, we're destroying Islam, bearing Muhammad, and exposing Allah as Satan. All glory to Jesus Christ. That's why they react this way, because they cannot refute the truth. But may Jesus make us bold lions and warriors facing anything for him and even dying for him by the power of the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. Now, those were the two points I addressed, the one with the cool of the day and, and Paul. Let me address another canard of Shabir. And he by the said, way, I want you to be aware of this. Uh, we have about 10 minutes today, so okay. whatever you can. But these are powerful. Yeah. Yeah, this will be the last point because I have more. Like I said, we're going to do multiple parts in the series. In Absolutely. So it's going to be probably five, six, seven, eight parts. I don't know. Amen. Amen. By the way, your good look is bringing a lot of people, Sam. Well, hopefully I get skinnier by the grace of Jesus and get healthier and stay on my, my diet by his grace and mercy so I can get more people to subscribe to me and less people subscribe to you. I mean, if someone like you with your looks could get 40,000, I should have about 10 million, bro. Yeah, you're an inspiration to me, Sam. So go ahead, bro. All right. <laughs> Final point, because it says we're down to, okay, about 10 minutes. Sorry. He he was commenting about the serpent when God cursed the serpent. Let's go there. Let's see the, what the curse was. Let's go to Genesis 3. Genesis 3, if you're there, brother, can you read for me 14 and 15? Genesis 3, 14 and 15. All right. I'll go to Genesis 3, 14 and 15. The judgment right. on the serpent. And this is so easy to refute. It's, it's nonsensical. Yeah. So starting from verse 14 in Genesis 3, the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you will go, and dust you will eat all the days of your life. Verse 15, and I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. Okay, now, Shabir says that in Genesis, we are not told that the serpent is Satan. That's come, that comes from later revelation, which is true. In later Revelation, we're, we're told that the serpent is, is Satan. So Shabir takes it at face value. The serpent is an actual animal. The serpent is an actual snake. So then he wonders. He asks the question mockingly as if he thinks he's slick in his mockery. He doesn't know. I answer fool according to his folly to show that he's stupid. Proverbs 26 verse 5. Proverbs 26 verse 5. Answer a fool according to his folly lest he becomes wise in his own mind. So I'm going to answer this fool and show how stupid and foolish he is. Proverbs 26 verse 5, folks. I'm being biblical. And he's wondering, does that mean a serpent used to stand and later on started crawling? Well, you know, we don't know. It's mocking tone. This again shows he's an ignoramus and that either he doesn't want to understand the Bible or his duty in life is to mock the scriptures and attack the scriptures and insult the God of the Bible, though he pays lip service to the fact that he believes the God of the Bible is a true God and he respects the Bible. No, he doesn't. Look, I'm up front. I have no respect for Muhammad or the Quran or the God of the Quran because Muhammad is an antichrist who not only had women raped and prostituted in the name of his God, not only murdered men and enslaved women and children and oppressed people and brought great misery, but he is responsible for damning 
millions to hell with a false gospel and a false god. That is not a man. In fact, let me just be very honest. He's worse than Hitler. Why? Because Hitler killed people physically. Muhammad not only killed people physically, but he murdered their souls and sent them straight to everlasting destruction. So who is worse, Muhammad or Hitler? You decide. This is why I don't respect this man. And again, my challenge, because it's going to take me real quick to respond to this. My challenge to you Christians who think I'm too harsh or Christian prince, prince is too harsh or Osama Dakdok too harsh. My challenge to every one of you, quote me a single passage in the entire Bible where the prophets, where the Lord Jesus apostles showed respect and love to false prophets, false teachers, blasphemers, and Bible perverts. Show me that scripture. So then why are you showing respect to such demons? Because James White told you to do so? Because Mike Lacona told you to do so? Because William Craig told you to do so? They are not the standard of Christianity. The Bible is. And folks, you'll be shocked. Go read the church fathers. Go read about even Martin Luther, how they treated heretics. St. Nicholas, from where you get Santa Claus. Tradition says that at the Council of Nicaea, St. Nicholas, where we get Santa Claus, slapped the heretic Arius in the mouth. Slapped him. Go read John of Damascus and how he attacks Muhammad and how he attacks Islam. And then go read what Martin Luther said about those who opposed him. This wishy-washy, effeminate brand of Christianity is not biblical Christianity. Enough of this. It's getting us nowhere. Now, with that said, when God says to the serpent, on your belly you'll crawl, right, and dust you shall eat, does that imply this is an actual snake that was standing? No, not at all. This again shows that Shabir doesn't know biblical metaphor. Let me show you that in Genesis 3, 14, when we're told that the serpent, part of the judgment is that he'll crawl on his belly and eat dust all the days of his life. That doesn't mean this is an actual serpent who is standing up and now all serpents are cursed to crawl on their belly. It is a metaphor for being humiliated. It is a metaphor for being subjugated. It is a metaphor for being abased, destroyed, conquered, vanquished and humiliated let me prove that to you can you go to psalm 72 verse 9 psalm 72 verse 9 all right hey, victor didn't get it. victor are you listening victor i just told you it's not an animal that the serpent probably had legs <laughs> he's called a serpent because he is a spiritual creature who was serpentine nachash and the Bible proves that. I may do a session on that. I already have some sessions on it on my YouTube channel. But yeah, let's do that, brother. That's awesome. All right, 72 verse 9. Yes. All right, Psalm 72 verse 9. So it says, Let the nomads of the desert bow before him and his enemies lick the dust. They're going to do what, brother? Lick the dust. Who? The enemies of the anointed king, right? Bow before him and lick the dust. In other words, when he conquers his enemies and he vanquishes him, he's going to humiliate them by having them having them lick the dust of the ground. See, this is a metaphor. Licking the dust is a metaphor. And from the or Middle East, humiliated. we know that that's what it means. And from the Middle East, if you if you start talking to me this way, you are humiliating me when you're talking right. about licking the dust and bowing down and things like that. And let me give you another example. Micah 7. Verse 17, and then I guess we're done. My, well, are we done? Micah 7, verse 17. Micah 7, verse 17. All right, so verse 17 reads, Micah 7, verse 17. It says, they will lick the dust like a serpent, mm -hmm. like reptiles of the earth. They will come trembling out of their fortresses to the Lord our God. They will come in dread, and they will be afraid before you. They will do what? They will lick the dust like a serpent. You see the point now. Human beings lick the dust like reptiles and serpents. What does that mean? They're being humiliated. They're being vanquished. They're being conquered. They're being abased for their persistent rebellion against the true God. So when God says to the serpent, 
on your belly you will crawl and you will lick the dust all the days of your life. That doesn't mean the serpent was an actual animal who used to walk on its legs and then now the legs were cut off and now it's cursed to crawl. The serpent, according to the totality of Scripture, the totality of Scripture, okay? If you interpret Genesis in light of its immediate and overall context and how the Jews understood this passage, I'm not talking about modern Jews, I'm not talking about liberals, I'm not I'm talking about the ancient tradition. The serpent wasn't an actual animal. He was a spirit creature whom the New Testament identifies as Satan. The word nachash, nachash, even in Numbers 21, verses, 9 to, 9, verses 4 to 9. Write down Numbers 21, verses 4 to 9. If you read Numbers 21, verses 4 to 9, there you'll see that God sent upon the Israelites fiery serpents. Go back and see what the words are in Hebrew. Hanachashim uh, hasafarim. Uh, Serafim, I'm sorry. What did I get? Safarim. I get Safarim confused with Serafim because Safarim are scribes. Hanachashim ha Serafim. Why is that important? Go back. Don't take my word for it. Those fiery serpents are called Hanachashim ha Serafim. Saraf. Do you know why that's important? In Isaiah 6, verses 2 to 3, Isaiah sees Seraphim, Seraphim with wings, six wings. Yeah. Folks, fiery you know, serpent, uh, fiery uh, angel. Do you know what the word Seraphim is in Isaiah 6? It's the same word used for serpents and snakes. In other words, here in Isaiah 6, you have creatures that are called serpents, seraph, seraphim, because they are serpentine in shape. And this is confirmed in Isaiah 14, verse 29. Isaiah 14, verse 29, where the word nachash and seraph are used together to show you that a seraph can be a nachash, a nachash can be a seraph, meaning a snake can be called a seraph, fiery, and a seraph can be called a nachash, snake. And in Isaiah 6, those seraphim, they're not animals. They're spirit creatures that are serpentine. And to make a final connection, to blow you guys away, the seraphim of Isaiah 6, if you go to Revelation chapter 4, the four living creatures are identified as the seraphim of Isaiah 6. But the four living creatures also are identified as the cherubim of Ezekiel 10. In other words, when you read Revelation 4 and you see the four living creatures, John describes them as the very cherubim that Ezekiel saw in Ezekiel 10 and the seraphim that Isaiah saw in Isaiah 6. You know what that means? The seraphim are the cherubim. The cherubim are the seraphim, which means you can make a strong case that the serpent, Satan, was a cherub who fell from favor. A fallen angel. That's exactly In other the words, it's not a snake. Nachash there, serpent, referring to him being a cherub who was before the throne of God who fell from favor. That's and here is, where I wanna, here is where I want to stick it to Shabir, who knows no Arabic, no Greek, and no Hebrew, and he's way out of his league. When he thought he was mocking Jay and me when we said the word al bariah in chapter 98 verse 6, do you know why the uh, Al-Tabari, for instance, and others says the reading al bariya versus al bariya to describe the creatures who are worst of creatures and best of creatures, you know? You know why they said al bariya is not uh, basically a good reading? Because it includes angels. That mean angels are sinners also. And that flies in the face of traditional Islamic teaching that angels are not fallen angels. So uh, there you go, man. Uh, thank you, Shabir. You keep our job so easy, man. Uh, we're going to put some links for him here. Uh, I'm going to put links for your articles because he needs to read them and for uh, commentary and uh, other things. Before you end it, let me correct this guy who, again, thinks he knows scripture. He just said the serpent was an, an, an animal. Let me show you that John says you're a liar. Uh, Kurt Dick, John says you're a liar. Do you know why? Folks, you want me to prove it to you from John? The serpent was an animal. It was actually Satan. How many of you guys want me to expose this guy for being biblically illiterate, for pontificating, embarrassing himself, for creating a contradiction in the Bible because of his ignorance? This, this pontificator who's a Bible pervert. 
Let me prove to you the serpent wasn't an animal. Go to Revelation 12, verse 9, brother, and read it for me. Revelation 12, verse 9. Yes, here it is. So don't ever pontificate and in your ignorance pervert scripture because you're going to mislead people and then I'm going to have to embarrass you, brother. Sorry, I'm not here to tickle ears. Here's the proof from John. If you're a Christian, if you're a Christian, you believe in the New Testament, John, by revelation of Jesus, tells you the serpent in the garden wasn't an animal. Read Revelation 12, verse 9. All right, Revelation 12, verse 9. Here it goes. And the great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old, who is called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. Did you guys catch it? Satan the devil is that serpent of old. Roy Fisher, it seems like you're a Mohammedan, a tool of the devil, a son of the devil. Lord Jesus, rebuke you and grant you repentance. But you see that? It didn't say Satan possessed the serpent. Satan entered the body of a serpent. It says Satan is that serpent. Revelation 20, verse 2. Read verses 1 and 2. Revelation 20, verse 2. And read verses 1 and 2 for the context. All right. Here you go. Revelation 20, starting verse 1 and 2. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding the key of the abyss and a great chain in his hand. Verse 2. And he laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. Okay. Now, before you move on, Prabhsheep, deep. Yes. Second Corinthians eleven fourteen 14 says, the devil can masquerade as an angel of light. Yes. Prabhsheep, deep. 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen. it says, No wonder, for say, even Satan appears as an angel of light, masquerades as an angel of light. Spirit beings are created with the ability to change their shapes. So, yes, there's your answer. End of story. If you're a Bible-believing Christian, that serpent is not an animal. That was Satan himself. Nor does the Bible say Satan possessed the serpent. It says Satan is the serpent, like Satan is the dragon. Now that said, time is up. Christ is risen. He is Lord. We love you, Father, Holy Spirit. Keep us in love with you. Make us holy. Give us the help we need and the provisions to serve you unto death. Maranatha, Lord Jesus, come. Amen. Amen. I hope everybody's benefiting from these deep, deep teachings. And brother, we're looking forward to the next one. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Thank you for those who gave. We appreciate your love and sacrifice. Thank you for the moderators for an amazing job you did. And folks. Yes, I blocked more than one person as we are going through the show. You know why? Because I have no patience for those who come here to blaspheme, to distract, and to just put the spotlight on their own dumb agenda. All right. Thank you, brother. Love you. And uh, everyone here, we will see you soon. God bless you all. Take care.